Good morning, everybody. This is Greg Waitley with CTC and Associates, and we're here today for the uh, closeout webinar for uh, the Defense of Driving for Snowplow Operators, which is the final deliverable for this project. We are joined today by uh, Matt Camden of Virginia Tech, uh, who is the principal investigator on this project, and he'll be leading us through a presentation today. Uh, just a couple housekeeping items. If you uh, have any questions or comments for Matt, please enter them in the chat box, and then we'll address them at the end of the presentation. And uh, please also keep your uh, phones or uh, computer audio on mute uh, during the presentation so that there's no background noise. Uh, I do want to say one other thing, and that is that uh, I messed up last night and I did not include Matt on the calendar invite. So Matt saved the day, uh, Matt Kimpton saved the day by spending last night and this morning putting together this slide deck and so we didn't have to reschedule. So I apologize for that. And I really appreciate Matt's hard work and dedication to uh, making sure that this came off at the, at the same time. So I just wanted to mention that. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Matt at Virginia Tech and Matt, whenever you're ready. Great. Great. Thanks a lot, Greg. Uh, so uh, as Greg mentioned, as you guys know, uh, this is the final briefing for uh, this uh, Clear Roads project on defensive driving for snowplow operators. Uh, so just start off with some background information. Uh, we at, at Virginia Tech, amongst a bunch of other people, have done a lot of research looking at crashes involving large trucks and we're not just talking tractor trailers here we're talking all large trucks above 10,000 pounds and light vehicles and what we've found and what other people have found is that the vast majority of these crashes are usually not the result of something that heavy vehicle operator uh, did almost 80 percent of all of these incidences are the result of something you know that light vehicle driver did or a pedestrian or bicyclist or something um, and, and these crashes cause a lot of issues, especially for fleets, whether they're DOT fleets or private fleets. Um, of course, you know, property damage, um, any injuries and fatalities, unfortunately. I mean, these are, these are huge cost drivers as a result of these crashes. But specifically for, for snow plows, and, and as you guys know, if a snow plow is involved in a crash, it's very likely, if, especially if something gets damaged, even if it's minor, that vehicle could be put out of service and it could be put out of service for you know a significant amount of time. And if that happens during the middle of a snow or a winter weather event, you know, that significantly impacts your operations because most DOTs and, and private um, plow operations are, are really minimizing what equipment they have operating at one time just because of all the, the budgetary constraints uh, that everyone's facing right now. Um, and then if the fleets don't have all their trucks out on the road, you know, this has an impact on, on the general driving public. If we can't keep the level of service high during winter weather events, you know, these general public's still out there, they're still driving and it's less safe for them and causing traffic congestion and crashes. So uh, we really need to find ways to help snowplow operators uh, maintain their safety on the road. And this is kind of an oversight. A lot of a lot of the DOTs and, and other agencies out there, they, they do a lot of operator training, but most of that training is focused on, on how to actually control the plow, um, how to clear the snow, how to keep the roads clear, how to use their spreaders and things. Um, there's not much training on actual you know, safety for the snow plow operator. So that's kind of the where this project came from. We wanted to, to look at how can we keep the snow plow operator safe and avoid some of these crashes uh, to help reduce some of these costs and, and hopefully save injuries and save lives. Uh, so in terms of causes of snowplow crashes, you know, there's very little data or research published out there looking at what are the most common types of crashes that involve snowplows. And I'm sure all of, all of your DOT agencies have this data and have looked at it, but in terms of it being published for for other states to look at or their peers to look at or researchers to, to use, there's not much out there. Uh, there were two studies that we found. Um, one really wasn't looking at, at behavioral factors or uh, operator factors of these crashes. It was more of like weather condition factors. Uh, but there was one from 
from Michigan and looked at data from Michigan over approximately five years. And, and they found that the top contributing factors for these crashes um, or the top one was inattention or, or misjudgment from the actual snow plow operator. So this is almost 40% of all the crashes were the result of something the operator of the snow plow was doing or, or not doing. Um, the next top contributing factor was almost a quarter of them were loss of control. I mean, this kind of makes sense. We're driving in, in adverse conditions. Um, but usually with the loss of a control event, you know, most of those can probably be prevented if the driver was, you know, had been driving slower or not done a hard break or swerve at the last second on, on a slippery road. Um, the next top one was, you know, kind of what I think a lot of people would expect, you know, 20% of the crashes were inattention or misjudgment by the other driver. So whoever hit the snowplow, um, 7% were unknown three, a little over three and a half percent were poor visibility. And then the last top factor was uh, blind spots. So about two and a half percent of the crashes were uh, because a vehicle was was in the snowplow's blind spot. So this really leads us to, to looking at, you know, what kind of trainings out there and, and what are the best types of trainings that snowplow operators can get to help avoid these crashes? Again, you know, 40% of them were the result of something the snowplow operator did. And the other ones, all those other ones, except for the inattention by the other driver, a lot of those could be prevented um, by helping that operator understand or giving them skills or new education to learn you know, how they can anticipate and, and react to situations. So this really drives that and gets at uh, defensive driving. I'm sure everyone's aware of what defensive driving is. I'm, we all had it in driver's ed, or if we've had to do, um, you know, classes on the side, whether that's with your DOT agency or because we got a ticket or something. The foundation for most of those classes is defensive driving. It's been around for a long time. The National Safety Council uh, really started it back in the 60s, early 60s. And the foundation of defensive driving is to be able to assess risk and predict if that risk is going to become a hazard and react to it. Uh, so there's a lot of principles included in it, but number one, it is safe speed. Now, uh, if we can can be driving at a safe speed for the weather conditions and be observant of what's going on, the chances of us uh, being involved in a crash are significantly reduced. Uh, it gives us more time to react. It gives us more space to react. Um, so also anticipating other people's actions and mistakes, uh, staying alert while we drive, uh, checking blind spots, checking our mirrors, looking out the windows keeping a safe following distance, avoiding road rage, being courteous to other drivers, and then fatigue management, which also goes back to staying alert. So, so the project uh, with this one had really three main, main objectives. Uh, the first was to look at collisions involving snowfalls, identify what are the key causes of those crashes, and identify the top three to five most common uh, crashes that involve a snowplow. Uh, we also wanted to identify defensive driving strategies that snowplow operators can use to help reduce the likelihood of being struck by other drivers. But also, uh, we wanted to focus on you know, giving the operator strategies they can use to prevent crashes with anything, whether that's an object in the road, a curb, um, something in a parking lot, um, or also being hit or striking another vehicle. So the result of this, and really the, the main deliverable for this project, were two training modules. Uh, the first one was focused basically strictly on defensive driving, and then the second one was a more general safe driving module. So to develop these, these two training modules, we did a number of different tasks. Uh, the first, of course, is a lit review. We scanned the literature, wanted to see what was already out there. We wanted to see if there had been any evaluations or assessments of training for snowplow operators in terms of reducing crashes. Uh, we also did surveys with uh, Clear Roads managers and, and other uh, highway maintenance managers across the country. Uh, we collected uh, some snowplow crash data from DOTs, and we did kind of in-depth interviews to follow up on the surveys to get 
uh, more qualitative information on what causes these snowplow crashes and what we can do to prevent them. And then finally, we, we analyzed all the data we collected to, to inform what was going to be included in, in the training modules. So we're going to walk through what we found in each of these, and then uh, we'll finish up with just a high level overview of what the trainings are. Um, of course, we couldn't go through both of our training modules during this webinar, but I did pull some select slides just to give you a flavor of what they look like, what type of information's in there. All right, so, so the first thing, as I just mentioned, was a lit review. Um, what we found was that there really is limited research on the effectiveness of defensive driving programs for snowplow operators. And this actually isn't unique to the snowplow community. In fact, there's very little research out there looking at defensive driving effectiveness for, for all professional drivers. We've seen stuff with teams, but of course, you know, professional drivers aren't team drivers. It's, it's a very different population. Um, so there, there's very little out there looking at, you know, is defensive driving um, effective at reducing crashes? I think the, the theory is that, of course, it is. The more we know about um, preventing crashes and strategies we can use to stay alert and assess risk, you know, of course, that, uh, that prevents crashes. But there really is just not very much empirical research out there. Um, but there is some, look, uh, some research looking at, um, and of course, I'm sure you guys are aware, and probably even use. Uh, agencies do conduct defensive driving training for snowplow operators. A lot of it's classroom-based, but some are also using simulators and, and some kind of uh, field types of practice. Um, most of the topics that are being used are around space management, so keeping a, a good amount of space in front of your vehicle or on the sides of your vehicle as they're plowing. Uh, speed management, of course, and not going too fast. Uh, communicating with uh, headquarters or their terminal, but also their their co-drivers out on the road as well. Uh, fuel management's often included, um, fatigue, and then the, the common technique of SIPDE, which means searching for hazards, identifying them, predicting if those hazards are going to become risks, deciding if uh, you need to execute something, and then finally executing that evasive maneuver or turn or lane change. Um, to avoid that hazard. So based on the, the lit review and looking at what kind of defensive driving programs are available commercially and free uh, for professional drivers, uh, we came up with a set of 11 recommended topics to be investigated further in the interviews and the surveys. Uh, so proper visual scanning, predicting and identifying hidden hazards, anticipating other actions, deciding uh, to react to hazards when it's acceptable and, and when that hazard may actually not uh, become a risk. How to execute evasive maneuvers, uh, safe speeds, alertness, road rage, common crashes, um, backing up types of crashes, and then also preparing the vehicle. All right, so after we finished the live review, we did a, a survey. Uh, so really the purpose of the survey was to follow up and further investigate the findings from the lit review um, and then collect data from the winter maintenance community on common crashes, what their contributing factors are, and then also any defensive driving strategies that are currently being used or should be incorporated into uh, the trainings that we are going to develop. Uh, there was an online survey. We did have paper copies available, but no one actually uh, came back and, and requested those. Uh, so everything was online. Uh, the way we distributed the survey out to people was we sent the, a link to the survey to all the Clear Road representatives. Clear Road representatives then had the choice to, to send it out to in the listserv in their state or the managers to, uh, to choose to um, respond to. It was all voluntary. Um, we also sent it out to the AASHTO Snow and Ice Listserv. We got a few responses from there, not too many, um, but most of the responses came from, from Clear Roads. And, and the survey was designed around kind of four topics. Uh, one was snowplow crashes. So, you know, we wanted to get a handle on you know, how many snowplow crashes that state or division uh, experienced, what types of crashes they were, what were the common contributing factors. Uh, we also asked about additional 
things that occur during those crashes. So environmental factors, roadway factors, level service factors that may be related. They may not have caused the crash, but uh, they maybe have uh, played an impact on, on that crash. Uh, we also asked about you know, suggested strategies that we could incorporate into the final training product. Uh, and then finally, we asked if they were willing to participate in a follow-up interview. So out of all the surveys we sent out um, to each of the Clear Road states, we, we received 86 back from 20 states. So it's pretty, pretty well represented across the Clear Road's population. Uh, so the first thing we asked about was, was the crash data. Um, here you can see the results of uh, all, all the crashes self-reported by the, the survey respondents. We asked about the total number of crashes. You can see that you know, uh, hitting fixed objects were the most common with 162. Uh, and this was within the previous year across all survey response, uh, respondents. Um, next one was being rear-ended by another vehicle. Other common ones were side swipes, uh, run off the road crashes, uh, wing plow strikes, and backing incidences. But we also wanted to know about the preventable crashes. So when, when we're developing the training, the best thing to focus on is the low hanging fruit. And, and those are the things that the snowplow operator can prevent or do something that may prevent or mitigate the crash. So we wanted to know, you know how many of these crashes are the preventable ones. Uh, so you can see, you know, by far hitting fixed objects, most preventable. And we also, of course, had backing. Backing crashes are 99.99% preventable. Um, other common ones were rear end crashes. So even though the percentage of, of being rear end crashes uh, is pretty low, because there's so many crashes where the operator is rear ended by another vehicle, there's a high high number of those that may be prevented by something the operator could do. Um, other ones are, are run off the road crashes. The good thing looking at these numbers here, these self-report numbers is most of the crashes that are really high severity crashes. So head-on crashes, rollover crashes, uh, broadside crashes. Those ones are, are, are pretty low. So that's, that's really good. Um, the most common crashes here are the ones that are lower severity. They're you know, not often killing somebody um either the operator or somebody else um, but they of course add up in property damage and over a year over a snow season all of these minor crashes significantly add up take vehicles off the roadway cost dots a lot of money um so it's really important to even focus on the, these minor crashes but some of the other ones like run off the road that could result in a lot of uh, a lot of costs could total the vehicle driver could be injured driver could be killed um, so even though you know, a lot of the runoff roads are, are pretty, pretty minor. They do have high impacts as well. Uh, we also collected, as I mentioned, the, the DOT provided crashes. So this isn't self-report. We actually got crash data sets from three states. Um, across all those three states, we had a total of eight years of crash data. Uh, so this isn't, you know, every state giving us eight years. Um, one state gave us three or four years, another state gave us two years, and, and the third state might have given us one or two years. Um, and, and the purpose of doing this is really to get um, objective data, just to double check the self-report data. And it's pretty, it's remarkably similar. Um, you know, the most common crash types looking at this data were fixed object strikes um, on road, also a lot in parking lots. Uh, had a lot of backing crashes with either another vehicle or a fixed object. Now, other common ones were uh, being rear-ended, of course, by another vehicle uh, and wing plow strikes. So using these data, we selected uh, five of the most common crash types. So those were the fixed object crash, wing plow strikes, being rear-ended, um, uh, run off the road, and in backing crashes so based on this data those are the five crash types we focused on in our interviews and uh, in the training modules themselves 
Uh, in the survey, we also asked about contributing factors to the crushes. This is really important because this is going to inform, you know, what topics we need to include. We want to include training topics that address the most common contributing factors. So we broke out these crashes in, into three types. So uh, when there's a crash where the snowplow is at fault, uh, the survey respondents said inattention, fatigue, poor situational awareness, complacency, unsafe speed, and adverse conditions were most common contributing factors to those crashes. Uh, when the snowplow was involved in a crash where the other vehicle was at fault, uh, usually it was unsafe speed, and that could be either way. It could be unsafe speed of the following vehicle or unsafe speed of the snowplow, um, general risky driving by the other vehicle, inattention by the other vehicle driver, and then also limited visibility. And the third type of crash we asked about were single vehicle crashes. So these often are, are those runoff road crashes or pit fixed object crashes. And, and these contributing factors match up pretty closely to where uh, the snowplow was at fault, um, which makes sense. So poor situational awareness, fatigue, inexperience, unsafe speed, and, and adverse conditions. Uh, and then finally, we asked about the recommended training topics that we should include when we develop the, the snowplow operator training. Uh, five main topics that, that came out of that. Uh, crash avoidance techniques. So this was um, you know, general defensive driving, anticipating hazards, uh, how to respond correctly, um, you know, not, not doing a hard steer on, on wet snow or ice, things like that. Um, also, some vehicle and equipment information. So, uh, becoming familiar with, with what controls are in the vehicle, how it operates. Um, op operator alertness was a common a common topic and that was brought up. Uh, general safe operation of the plow um, and, and the snowplow itself. Uh, and then route planning. Route planning usually had to do with you know, not driving during or plowing during high peak travel times for the general public. So if you could clear the snows before rush hour uh, or around the lunchtime, that's best. You're, you're ex limiting your exposure to being around other vehicles. So based on the people who responded to the survey, uh, we conducted the interviews and, and really the, as I mentioned before, you know, the purpose of these interviews was to get much more in-depth information on the causes of crashes and suggested training topics. Uh, so it's all, it was almost like a brief small case study at the states that we talked to. Uh, we did 19 total interviews and when the interviews were with uh, some operators themselves, uh, quite a few individuals with a safety responsibility. So somebody maybe in, in the state DOT's um, safety department uh, we also talked to a few trainers, driver trainers, a few superintendents, and then also uh, managers, uh, highway maintenance managers. And it covered six states. Uh, so we we talked to people in California, Colorado, Idaho, Montana, Ohio, and then Virginia. You can see that there's a, a West Coast lean here, which which kind of makes sense. The more mountainous states, you know, they get a lot more snow. So it's it was important for us to capture their experience. They're out there plowing more than the people here in Virginia. Um, but it was important to, to get representation from other places across the country too. So we got a Midwest uh, with Ohio and then uh, here on the East Coast, Virginia. So when we were going through these interviews, uh, we, we focus on those five main or, or five most common crash types. Uh, when we talked to the, the people in the interviews, the questions centered around, you know, what we're causing these crashes and what can we do to help the operators prevent them? Uh, so I broke this section up into those five common crashes. So the first one we touched on were fixed object strikes. Um, the, the people we talked to, the operators, managers, uh, trainers themselves, you know, recommended five main uh, topics that we should include to help operators prevent these fixed object strikes. So one is becoming familiar with the route. A lot of times, um, when things are covered with snow, you know, these hidden objects can't be seen. So it's really important for the operators to get out before the snow happens, become familiar with the route, mark any known hazards, um, 
know when they should adjust the plow to, to avoid you know, manhole covers or, or bridge joints. Um, of course, we couldn't provide too much training or education on this, but we did include it in the training. It was really important just to make the operators aware that you know, this is a good idea. You, you really need to do that. It's gonna help you understand where these hidden hazards are, uh, where the curbs are, where you should be plowing um, when the snow does cover the road. Now, second, second topic was just increasing situational awareness. So strategies to help drivers uh, remain vigilant as they're going down the road, uh, proper scanning techniques, limiting distractions, and then also strategies to help reduce or eliminate those pesky backing incidents. Uh, also fatigue management. So a lot of fixed object strikes are because the driver's just not alert or is tired. So recommended topics were you know, possibly covering limiting hours, taking breaks, getting good nutrition um, before starting your shift. Um, another one, become familiar with equipment, so just, just practicing before the snow event. Uh, and then save snow plow operation. So this was really about speeds, uh, what's a good plow speed, um, how to properly turn the vehicle so you don't want to slam on the brakes and make a quick turn. You don't want to put your turn signal on um, in advance. You want to make a wide turn. You want to clear the turnarounds as much as possible so you don't have to do, do any unnecessary backing maneuvers. Um, and then plowing on the pavement as much as possible. Sometimes, of course, it's, that's not possible, um, but one of the topics we, we talked about and heard from was the importance of, of trying to stay on the pavement as much as possible, because when you get off into the, the soft shoulders or, or really wet uh, dirt or mud, you know, that wing plow or the front plow can, can pull that, um, the truck off the road and, and hit anything on the shoulders. Uh, the second one we talked about was run off the road crashes. Uh, so oftentimes uh, these run off the road crashes could be the result of distractions or fatigue or, or kind of looking out their mirrors at the wrong time. Uh, but more often, a lot of these run off the road crashes were kind of what I just mentioned, the, the wing plow getting stuck in the soft shoulder and, and pulling it down or the front plow getting stuck in the soft shoulder and, and pulling the truck over off the road. Uh, so the two main topics we heard about were improving situational awareness, so uh, doing good hazard assessment, uh, remaining vigilant, good scanning, uh, staying within the edge line if you're not perfectly clear where the edge of that pavement is, and then also fatigue management. Uh, the second topic was just safe snowplow operation again, so good speeds, uh, limiting the downward pressure to help uh, prevent that, that plow from getting stuck in the soft ground. Um, maximizing reach of the plow so that the wheels can stay on the pavement, even if the, the plow blade itself is not. Uh, trying to keep a low center of gravity and just experience of the snow plow operator. Uh, the, the third crash type was backing up. As I mentioned, number one most frustrating crash uh, type that, that we hear, not just from, from you guys in the snow plow community, but all fleets backing are, are the most frustrating. Uh, so three main topics to include in our in our training were increasing awareness, you know, cleaning lights so that you know the area around the vehicle is illuminated. You can see what's there. Doing walk arounds prior to backing up, um, and and this isn't just walking around and looking at the truck, right? Like a pre-trip inspection. It's looking and, and looking to see where you are going to actually back up. Um, so if you're in a garage, that means opening the garage door, going out into the lot and look to see exactly where you're going to be backing up. And if there's anything in the path of that vehicle that, that you may hit. Um, also using spotters or delineator posts. Uh, second one is just limiting exposure to backing. You know, it, it's best if we don't back. Uh, so if there's a way you can just kind of pull to a to a curb and eliminate backing altogether, that's even better. Um, if you get to a turnaround, clear the turnaround as much as possible to help remove um, the need to back if that turnaround's large enough. Um, also, you know, backing into a spot versus pulling into a spot. It, it's safer for vehicles to back in the first time instead of pulling in front ways and then backing out as, as you leave. 
Uh, and then finally, what was technology? So this wasn't a huge thing. We don't have control about that. And the operator doesn't have much control about that too, but just brought about the importance of if, if the truck has a backup camera, use it. Um, we all usually have experience either in our own cars or a rental car with, with vehicles with backup cameras. Um, and, and they're pretty good, but we can't rely on them. Uh, we also have to look over our shoulders, use our mirrors and things. Uh, also, if the garage has a door indicator, use it. Uh, don't get into the into the truck with the garage door down. It happens all the time. People are tired. People have uh, just getting ready for a shift. They're not paying attention. They're, they have a lot going on and they'll back up right into that closed garage door. So if there's a, a door indicator saying whether the door is open or closed, you know, that's, that's a great tool to have. Uh, the fourth crash type was crashes where another vehicle rear ends the snowplow. Again, these are very frustrating crashes. And, you know, unfortunately, there's not much the operator can do to prevent these crashes. It, it's really on whoever's following the vehicle, right? Whether they're not paying attention because they're distracted or they're tired or they're just being aggressive or they don't know how to drive in winter conditions. You know, the operator can't really do too much about that. Um, but the good news is we did hear some things uh, from the people we interviewed on suggestions to include in the training. Uh, so one is, is related to the equipment. Make sure your lights are clean so that anyone following you can see the lights, can see your warning lights, or, or make sure the reflective tape is cleared off. Um, also, a lot of information we got was uh, on, on the warning lights themselves, whether that's the light color, um, or how the warning lights are operating. So one, one of the things that we talked about across all the interviews were turn signals. So oftentimes somebody may rear in the truck because they're not anticipating that truck turning. So often you guys know the, the plows have a lot of warning lights going on. Well, somebody following that snow plow may actually not see that turn signal because there's so many lights going on. Uh, one state we talked to actually had the ability to um, deactivate some of those warning lights, not all of them, but some of them once the turn signal was turned on. So just to give um, the other um, following people a chance to maybe notice that turn signal uh, compared to if all those lights were still going on. Um, signal timing, turn signal timing. This is, this is important too. Don't wait until the last second before a turn to activate that turn signal. You know, put it on, um, well in advance, but not too far in advance, because if you put it on too far in advance, you know, the people following you may think you just forgot to turn it off and it was still on. But so well-timed activation of that turn signal is important. Um, also suggestions on maybe a, a rear spoiler to help reduce the snow cloud and the use of reflective tape. And the second one was specifically about that snow cloud. So this is a this is a big cause of, of these rearing crashes. So you know speed's huge. Uh, for the snow cloud, one of the best ways to, to reduce it is by reducing speed. Of course, that doesn't always work if we have really, really strong winds or a lot of snow. You know, that snow cloud's, that snow cloud's going to be there, but speed's important. Um, if possible, plow with the wind. You know, Of course, you can't always do that, but if there is an option, you know, plow with the wind. Um, reduce speeds prior to turn. So this gets at, you know, if you're going down the road, you got a snow cloud behind you. Um, try to slow down well before that turn so that that's the, the snow cloud drops down some and, and maybe anybody following you can, can see that you're slowing down and you're ready to initiate a turn. Uh, there are a, a few topics related to just the operation of the plow itself. So uh, what we know is that oftentimes plows going down the road, there's going to be a, a long line of traffic back behind it. Occasionally, it's important to, to let that traffic pass. What we know is that when people are, are stuck behind something going slower, whether that's a snowplow or a tractor trailer or, or whatever, people get, get agitated. Um, they're going to be more likely to be aggressive, to weave, to try to pass um, unsafely. So if there's an opportunity to let that traffic pass, that's, that's great. Uh, another one is just you know, trying to plow their non-peak hours, um, having good winter driving techniques, um, potentially using convoys. So instead of having just one plow out at one time, you know, have a team or, or multiple plows out. 
uh, and also choosing safe turnaround locations. So it's important to try to choose as much as possible turnaround locations with good sight lines where the operator can see in both directions uh, so that they know if somebody's gonna be approaching quickly and, and they could avoid that and wait. Uh, increasing situational awareness is, is you know, hazard assessment and communication. And then of course, public education. Uh, so that's kind of outside the scope of, of this project itself. But, you know, of course, we need to educate the public on, on safe practices. I know Clear Roads has done some projects on that. Um, but of course, you know, all the outreach and education for the general driving public, the better. And then finally, the, the last one are wing plow strikes. So um, just training on, on a, or using additional equipment on that wing. So having rear facing lights on the end of that wing or reflective tape or potentially having the rear spoiler to, to get rid of the snow clouds. So uh, the, the following public will know that that wing plows there, um, snow deflectors potentially. Uh, to go back a little bit, so th there's kind of two main types of wing plow strikes, right? When the wing plow strikes a fixed object and when somebody tries to pass a plow with a wing out there. So the most common one we focus on were wing plow strikes where another vehicle tries to pass the plow and strikes the back of the wing. Uh, so this is very similar to, to the rear end crash. Um, so as you can see here, some of these suggested strategies are, are similar. Um, public education. And then, and then the last one is just proper use of the wings. Um, so you know, although you can use wings to clear any part of the road, whether it's a driving lane or a non-driving lane, um, the people we talk to, the experts, suggest using the wings only on the shoulders or those non-driving lanes, unless you have a following vehicle that is teamed with the snowplow to keep other vehicles back, or there's a convoy um, that are spaced appropriately so that other cars can't swerve in and out of all the snowplows. All right, so, so we did all of all of uh, data collection, we analyzed the data, we found you know, the most suggested training topics that were relevant to include in our training. Um, and we created the two, two training modules. They were based in PowerPoint. Uh, the first one was designed at providing operators education to prevent those crashes or help mitigate those crashes caused by another driver. So this is the, the one that's really focused on the defensive driving aspects and the defensive driving concepts. Um, and it targets on the wing plow strikes and being rear-ended by another vehicle. Uh, the second one is looking at preventing crashes that are caused by the snowfall operator. So this is more just general safe driving and targets run off the road crashes, backing incidences, and hitting fixed objects. Um, when we developed the training, it was important for us to follow the, the best practices regarding uh, PowerPoint presentations and, and online training. So this involved you know, limiting the amount of content on the slide, making sure there's high contrast between the words and the background of the slide, uh, using diagrams, images, uh, things like that, not having a lot of words on the slide. Um, we also use video examples, whether that was naturalistic videos that, that we've collected along the years in our research or creating simulations. Um, we also were able to pull some YouTube videos um, as examples as well. Uh, and then also each slide has a suggested narration that the trainer can use. So the trainer can choose to you know, use our suggested narration word for word as they deliver the training, or they can use our suggested narration just as a guide to develop their own script uh, on what should be covered. Um, on a, a number of the slides, we also have just some supplemental notes for the, the trainer or facilitator to prompt them to ask questions at certain points or provide example prompt questions and example answers, correct answers to those questions. All right, so, so the first one is the defensive driving training. Uh, this one is 59 slides. And included in these 59 slides, we have uh, a mix of, um, we call it check on learnings, or basically just periodic breaks with a prompt question uh, to help keep the learners or the operators engaged in the training, and also to help uh, gauge 
their knowledge retention? Are they paying attention? Are they understanding what the what the concepts that are being covered are? And those questions are about you know every space every five or so slides. Uh, so out of the the fifty nine slides, probably about forty to forty five of them are are content focused. And the slides cover four main topics: so basic defensive driving, cleaning the equipment, um, making sure your lights, windows are, are clear of um, of snow and ice buildup. You know, doing the the pre trip inspections, things like that. Uh, using your vehicle lights appropriately, how to use your turn signals when you should activate them, um, and then relevant snowfall operating characteristics. All right, so you know, of course, we can't go through all of this training, right? So I just pulled out um, five or six slides just to give you a feel for what is included, what's covered, and what it looks like. So here's kind of the, the landing page or, or the, the uh, title slide for the training. Uh, here's a slide on, on visual scanning for hazards. So, you know, talking about the importance of scanning, looking for other vehicles, fixed objects, other road users, whether that's you know somebody walking on the side with their dog or or uh, a bicyclist or um, somebody on skis going down the side of the road. Um, talking about wide scanning patterns. So we don't want to just you know focus solely on what's ahead of us. We need to scan all around us. Um, so looking further down the road, not just directly in front of the truck, uh, looking to the left and the right. And looking, you know, 15 seconds ahead, and, and this is about a quarter of a mile, um, or one to one and a half city blocks, depending on, on where the plow is operating. And you can see here's a kind of a, a screenshot or a picture um, that we've scattered about the presentation. Uh, this is just, you know, a, a real life example from from some of our, our past research, looking at, you know, what are some of the hazards that may be out there, whether it's an overhead. Uh, overhead power line, a vehicle in front of us, an approaching vehicle on the side, um, a ditch that's covered with, with snow that may be hard to see, or a cone. Um, talk about the no zones, you know, these are these are spots where things could be hidden from the operator's point of view. So we have a diagram showing, you know, where they are, um, what to what to pay attention to, and, you know, it's really important to, to check the mirrors at, at all times. So every you know, eight to 10 seconds, scan those mirrors, see if anybody's riding beside you. It's important to, to know who's around you and where they are, just in case something happens and, and you need to make uh, an invasive maneuver or you need to change lanes to avoid uh, you know, a fixed object that's coming. It's important to know if somebody's beside you and know if it's safe to, to change lanes or to get over. Uh, here's an example of, uh, of a video we pulled. So this actual video is on, on YouTube, it's from, uh, Wisconsin, and you know, it really just shows dangers of, of the snow cloud. Uh, so, and there were two two plows here going side by side. Um, we had video from one, or maybe this is a tractor trailer uh, that this video was captured from, but showed that snow cloud, showed how bad it was, how how bad the visibility is in the snow cloud. Um, just to give operators, you know, this is this is what can happen. Um, this is why it's important to think about the snow cloud behind you. on you know, it's pretty simple uh, strategies throughout so this one's on, on making safe left turns so we know a lot of rearing crashes occur when the snowplow is trying to make a left turn um so you know activate the signal 500 feet or so before the turn use your mirrors you know see if anyone's following you closely if you can do something about that Let's slow down early so do a gradual slow down don't break quickly and do a quick slowdown. Gradually slow down. That gives the vehicles behind you opportunities to, to recognize that you're slowing down and to change lanes or to slow down themselves to give you more space. Uh, and then, you know, look, of course, you don't want to turn, make a left turn in front of other traffic. So make sure traffic's clear before making that left turn. Uh, so the, the other module was, as I mentioned, safe driving uh, just general safe driving this one's a little bit longer it's 70 slides um, but once again it has every about every five or so slides there are uh, check on learnings you know little breaks um, to gauge you know students attention um, four main topics these are hazard identification 
uh, really focusing on um, fixed objects or um, backing type of crashes. Uh, safe backing procedures and then limiting distractions. What are distractions? What are some of the distractions that the operator may experience while they're plowing? And then what they can do to help reduce the risk associated with those distractions. And, and then finally, some fatigue management information. Uh, so, you know, once again, you know, here's the, the title page. We kept the, the theme kind of consistent across both so that uh, people understand, you know, this is the same type of training. Uh, so again, so visual scanning was in the last one, but here's some, some more information on visual scanning. We have it so that it, it's more related to, um, to these at fault crashes. So, you know, talking about how objects can be hidden, whether they're curbs or, or soft shoulders. So looking for clues um, that an object may be hidden. So a, a raised mound of snow on the side may indicate something's underneath that snow that, that may damage your plow. Um, scanning, continuously scanning, don't fixate on, on any one object, and then use the strategy of SIPDE, so searching, identifying, predicting, deciding, and ex executing. Uh, here's an example of one of the, the simulations we created. Um, so here, bird's eye view, here's a snowplow, it's clearing the shoulder over here. Um, there are other road users using the road. Now you'll notice the snowplow starts to approach uh, an object that's on the shoulder that they'll need to avoid, uh, limited visibility. And so the, the plow in this simulation just came over. Here's a, a first person view. So this would be the view that the snowplow operator had. We have the rear view mirrors up here. So of course, if this operator had looked into the rear view mirror, it could have avoided hitting that red car. Uh, so it's kind of just, gives an example of what we're talking about, the importance of scanning your mirrors, always checking before changing lanes or getting into a, a new driving lane. Uh, circle of safety, so th this is related to backing. Um, so, you know, before you go anywhere, before you back, you gotta get out and look. Um, and don't just look directly behind the vehicle, you need to look where you're going, including you know, both sides. Um, what's underneath the truck? Are you going to run over anything? What's what's above the truck? Is there an over overhanging power line or the garage door that hasn't been raised all the way that that would be hit? Um, also, what what's in front of the truck or, or and obviously what's in back of the truck? Um, examine the full path you intend to travel. You know, open the the garage door. Don't just assume that nothing's on the other side. So maybe somebody came and parked there in the last minute uh, since you went in. So open the garage door. Make sure it's open. Other suggestions are maybe you know doing one trip around in the clockwise fashion and then doing a second trip around in the counterclockwise fashion. Uh, it's also some suggestions are, are to use the same direction every time. That way you kind of get into a routine, know exactly uh, what to look for and where to look. Um, but that that's kind of open to, to whatever works best for each of the operators. But we do provide some suggestions. Uh, backing alternatives, here's a diagram just showing what we mean by, you know, it's, it's best to back in to a, a space on arrival versus pulling in front uh, frontwards. Um, other alternatives, parking on the curb, park just away from other equipment if possible so that it's less likely you're going to hit something um, or pull through spaces if you can. Uh, here's an example of a, a naturalistic driving video we have. So this is a uh, one that uh, we actually used in a, a previous study. It's publicly available, uh, and it, it really just drives home, you know, what happens, what does driver driver distraction look like, and, and what are some of the consequences. So you see the guys on his phone texting, and this other car cut him off. Fortunately, he looked up at the last second and was able to avoid that. But it really kind of just shows, you know how fast something can happen when the driver's not looking down the roadway. Uh, here's another one. So this is a, a fatigue example here. Um, a lot of times people think that, you know, your eyes are open, everything's fine. Well, you can see the guy's face here. Uh, this is another publicly available video. 
The guy's eyes never shut. He actually doesn't fall asleep. A lot of people think that, you know, fatigue only happens when you fall asleep. But he, his eyes are open, but he's almost like daydreaming. You'll see he's swerving in the lanes here, crosses this lane line, almost hits the curb. But his eyes, his eyes were looking forward. So he was almost in a daze. This is one of the main indicators of, of fatigue. Don't have to be asleep or have your eyes closed. Uh, so, you know, kind of just as a summary, you know, this project really addressed this gap in knowledge. It, it gives us a, a free um, training content to give to operators that focuses on their safe operation to avoid crashes. Uh, it's, there's a lot of stuff out there on, on how to operate the plow, you know, how to, how to clear the snow, how to use a spreader, all that stuff. Um, this training kind of fills that gap of, of giving some more information that's available on how the operators can prevent crashes and where they hit something, but also prevent crashes where somebody may hit the snowplow. Um, this is one of the first studies that actually collected snowplow crash data. It's really hard to find. I know you guys all have it, but it's really hard to find for, for anyone outside agencies uh, to find. Um, and this is also good for, for if you're trying to figure out if your state is doing a good job regarding safety of your plow operators um, to have information available from your peers and, and know what their experiences are with, with crashes. Uh, we identified you know, the most common crash types. We conducted and collected really in-depth uh, quality information on, on the crashes and what's contributing to them and suggestions for how to improve them. And we developed these two comprehensive engaging uh, training modules. Uh, so, kind of just next steps. I, I think this is this is a really great uh, first step, but there there are a lot of other things that that we can look at to help protect the snowplow operators from being involved in crashes. Um, as I mentioned, you know, a lot of the time, a lot of the research regarding snowplows is you know material use, um, clearing the roadway, level of service. There really isn't too much on you know the actual safety. So, you know, of course we we could use um, more data, a larger, more representative data set on snowfall crashes. Even though we got it from, from three states, the objective data, uh, the collection and analysis of a much larger data set that's representative of the entire country um, would be informative. Um, we also, it would be great to know, you know, are the students learning? Are the operators actually retaining the information included in this training? Is it translating into reduced crashes? Um, also, you know, rear facing lights, it's really important, I think, for the rear facing lights regarding that rear end type of crash. So, you know, are there different configurations uh, to help prevent those crashes, different colored lights, you know, where would we place lights to get the most impact to attract the following driver's attention? Um, what about advanced safety technologies? I know some states up in Alaska, they have some really great, interesting things on, on advanced safety technologies. These things are good. They prevent crashes for other types of vehicles. Does it work with snow plows? Can they help prevent some of these crashes? Um, public education, you know, I, I, as I mentioned before, ClearWords has developed some public education. Um, some state DOTs have their own public education, but I think this is critical and, and we can't do enough of it. If we can teach a general driving public how to safely share the road with trucks, whether that's just info infomercials, whether that's social media posts, or even more in depth, whether it involves people going out to driver's ed classes and talking to, to teens or adults on how to share the road with trucks, whether it's getting the general driving public inside of a snowplow in a parking lot and just seeing for themselves, you know, what it is that a snowplow operator can and can't see. Um, I think all these things can go a long way to help bring awareness of, of proper sharing the road information for snowplows. And then also, you know, complementary training. I think, you know, the PowerPoint computer base and class training is re is really critical. You have to have that. It's a foundation. Um, but does you know hands-on in the field training or or simulations um, using a driving simulator? How does that impact uh, crashes? And is it complementary or is it uh, needed to help re reduce crashes and, and see the same effectiveness? Uh, so that's that's all I have. I will be happy to answer any questions that that came up and, and that you thought about.
All right. All right. So, Thanks, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, so uh, this was an excellent overview of the project uh, and, and what you guys did for Clear Roads. Uh, I want to let everybody know that uh, there, uh, the, the, on the project page, there will be um, forthcoming, the final report has been approved. It's reviewed and approved. Uh, we're just formatting it uh, right now. And then there will also be the CTC prepared brief. Research brief will be on that page. Um, and there are, right now, the, these training modules are also available on the project page as well as on the training resources subject page under the research by topic tab of the Clear Roads website. So there's, uh, those resources are available in, in multiple locations. Uh, under those um, uh, retraining modules, I also want to mention besides the PowerPoints themselves, uh, there's also an instructional guide, uh, a post-training uh, assessment, and a post-training assessment key for each of those two training modules. So all those, uh, all those resources are available on the project page and on the training resources subject page under the research by topic tab of the Clear Roads website. Um, all right, with that, I'm going to uh, go to the chat box and read off a couple questions. So the first question we got from Scott Lucas of Ohio, and he asked, uh, were rear end collisions tracked and were the light configurations listed? I'm curious if light changes, moving to green lights reduce rear end collisions. Yes, Scott, that's a great question and, and something that we don't know. Uh, and I think it would be really interesting and important to know. Um, so, of course, uh, we we got the objective and subjective data on, on rear end crashes. Um, but what was not listed in the data sets that we collected were the conf light configurations of the truck. So we don't know, you know, you know how many lights were rear facing, what the color of those lights were. Um, that would be that's an interesting question, something that I think would be valuable to look into in the future. OK, uh, Cliff Spoonmore from Wyoming asked, uh, how long do you think these training decks will take? Two hours, four hours? Yeah, Each Cliff, one. thanks for bringing this up. I, I neglected to mention this either. Uh, so the good thing about these PowerPoints is that they're 100 percent editable revisable whoever by whatever state DOT or trainer is using them. Um, so the target was to get these training to about an hour to an hour and a half. Now, I think with the questions in there, um, we're looking more close to an hour and a half, maybe even two hours. The good thing is that the, the information is chunked by topic. Uh, so the the trainer could potentially do you know one topic a day so maybe you know 15 to 30 minutes one day 15 to 30 minutes the next day so they could break it up over into multiple days this is actually a good training technique anyways because it keeps refreshing and, and bringing to like the topic of safety <clears throat> excuse me over multiple days uh so it helps improve driver retention when when done that way but yeah i i think that Overall, including those breaks with those refresher trainings or refresher questions, um, probably about an hour and a half to two hours each. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I think that's the end of the questions other than a few comments. Very well done, excellent presentation. So again, I, I echo those, I, I really appreciate uh, the work that Virginia Tech did for us, Matt and uh, Jeff Hickman. Uh, so just ex another, it was the second, I think, project that this group has done for Clear Roads uh, in the last few years. So uh, just really do appreciate that. Um, I was also gonna say we are uh, recording, I recorded this presentation, so it will also be um, posted as a recording uh, on the project page. And the slide deck uh, that you just saw in this presentation uh, will also be available on the members only side of the website under the research project documents. So with that, uh, I wanna thank everybody for your time today. Uh, again, thank you to the Virginia Tech Research Team and have a great rest of your day.